Okay, so, um, so we have, don't have a lot of time, so let me use the remaining 20 minutes or so just uh, telling you the topics that uh, you should know for optics. And I'm going to try to do this from memory so that you can see that these are important topics. So the way I uh, remember this is by first breaking down this one topic optics into basic categories. So um, the, there's a two big categories and one smaller category that you should remember. The two big categories are essentially two different approaches to light. The geometric optics, that's what we spent a lot of time on. Uh, sometimes this is also called, let me get different color, sometimes this is called ray optics. And once you, you know, draw diagrams, then it makes sense because you're drawing a bunch of rays. And the other big set of topics is, I guess, um, let me call it physical, um, physical optics. And the other name for that is wave optics. And this is where we had to deal a lot of, a lot with the interference and, you know, uh, the, the wave nature of light. So that's the basic breakdown between, uh, breakdown in how we are approaching optics. So in terms of chapters, your chapter one was the introduction to all of this. It actually covered the both of them. And chapter two was the, um, is that where we did the lenses? Yeah, so chapter two is the wrap up of the geometric optics. Chapters three and four are physical optics. Yeah. So from the, those chapters, you can kind of see that it's going to be an even breakdown between them. You know, 50%, 50%, um, let me write that down. Um, in terms of the importance in the topics, about 50% and 50%. Now, uh, we did cover a little bit beyond this. On the first day, we actually started out with um, electro, magnetic nature of light. And it's not technically in your textbook, um, or I guess you could call this Maxwell's equations. Oops, Maxwell's equations. And you know, I wouldn't test you on Maxwell's equations because uh, even though you know, 4B is a prerequisite to this, but sometimes people forget 4B. But I do want to point this out, especially on the past exam, you will see uh, quite a few multiple choice questions relating to this. And I'll probably scale it down a little, but it's still going to be some part of your exam. So I don't know, if I'm giving it a percentage, this will probably be somewhere between five to 10% of your exam, which means uh, this had to get scaled down around, I don't know, 47 to, oops, 45 to 47% of the exam, 45 to 47% of the exam. So, um, so, you know, I want you to keep this uh, in mind. It's uh, um, what's covered towards the end of physics 4B and what I lectured on on the first day. Uh, you had some, did you have some homework questions on that? Not many. So, um, so that's why I'm trying to scale this down because I didn't give you a lot of homework questions on it, so it will only be to the extent, like speed of light. That's uh, um, one thing that your homework question actually was relating to. So that's something you'd have to know. I think last semester I spent a lot of time on displacement, uh, um, displacement current, and this semester I'm just gonna say, I'm not gonna test you on that. So that's the main big breakdown. And what I want to do is list the smaller set of topics and formulas and stuff that you are supposed to know and understand within this. So with the electromagnetic nature of light, I think I can just uh, write down one thing that you are supposed to know. Speed of light C is equal to one over square root of epsilon naught mu naught. Like that is the one thing you need to know that was in your textbook and it relates to the fact that light is an electromagnetic wave. And um, what we lectured on was there's a whole derivation of where this comes from and that will not, the derivation will not be on your exam. But you should know the result. Um, 
let me uh, divide, up, divide up the board so that I spend the remaining 15 minutes or so reasonably, productively. Um, let's see, maybe this way. So I'm, since I'm telling you they are about at equal level of the, uh, importance, let me divide up the board equally into geometric optics. Oops. And physical optics. And some things will be relevant to both of them. But I guess I'll just uh, do in, go in chronological order. If uh, something mattered in co covering geometric optics, then we'll start here, even though later on it'll be relevant to here also. So um, what do you remember from geometric optics? What, what do you remember covering? Yeah, reflection and refraction. That's the very basic uh, building block of geometric optics. In fact, everything else you do in geometric optics is the derivation from reflection and refraction. So you have, uh, right. so you have reflection and refraction. So reflection says the angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. And your textbook covered how this came from Huygens uh, principle of the wavelet. Interesting reading, but it won't be really on your exam. The refraction is where you should remember Snell's law. So Snell's law says that index of refraction times the sine of angle on one side is equal to index of refraction times sine of angle on the other side. And as you are remembering this, this is how I remember everything. Um, hopefully this reminds you, you have to define index of refraction. How is that related to other things? So um, I could have introduced this uh, here, but now that it came up, let me just uh, make sure we remember what index of refraction was. Index of refraction was defined as the refraction is equal to speed of light in vacuum divided by speed of light in matter. Okay. So if it's index or refraction of some material, then C is a constant, and speed of light in that matter would be property of the material. Okay. So this is the very basic starting point. But with the geometric optics, um, so the kind of problems you can do only with these will be limited. And they will actually be pretty difficult because they happen to involve a lot of geometry. And from my experience, most of people find the geometry difficult. Question? So should the numerator and denominator reverse? No, C is the greater number. Yeah. Greater number divided by smaller number, bigger than one. I see. That's how I remember things, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good? <laughs> okay, so this is the basic relationship you should know, so let me just uh, block this off. But um, most of the interesting questions you can do uh, won't be limited to this. So um, when you think of uh, geometric optics or ray optics, what's the, um, I don't know, the thing that you remember the most, two, three weeks after when we have covered it? Like, you know, so this is the starting point, but there are some useful applications that we covered. Yeah, lens equation. So it's um, really, all of that would fall under what you might call, uh, what color do I want? Um, let me call it optical devices. Optical devices. And over the expressions dealing with optical devices, the most important expression, number one expression, is the lens equation. Um, 1 over f is equal to 1 over do plus 1 over di. And coupled with this is a bit of ray tracing. So this uh, algebraic equation is actually, um, it carries the same information as a geometric ray diagram does. So you should remember the ray tracing rules. And for, um, I guess, 
basic situation like this with a lens um, of some focal length and some object here. You should know how to trace the rays to locate the image here. You should know how, I, so I guess the key phrase that you might, because you cannot search for a picture in your textbook, the key phrase you should know are the principal rays. Um, so I drew two principal rays there. There's a, there's a third one that I almost never draw. Um, so this is the most important thing when you are dealing with optical devices like lenses and mirror. And this, um, even though I prefer to draw lenses most of the time, this would apply equally well to curved mirrors. And so using this as a starting point, you should uh, have some idea of a bunch of formulas that were derived. And you know, this is why you have formula sheet. That's where you would write down those formulas. Let me just name them. Um, some of them I probably do have it memorized, but let me just name them so that I won't be embarrassed by not remembering them. Um, so some of the, let me call it list of formulas. Um, so there's the um, image formation by refraction. So um, image formation by refraction. So that's when you have a single refracting surface that uh, can form an image. So you know, let's say air on one side, glass on the other side. And using this twice can actually give you the formula that we call lens maker's formula. Lens maker's formula. Um, I don't think this really featured all the, I, I think this featured in your homework. I'm not sure if lens maker's formula was ever in your homework. Was it? Yes. yes, maybe once or twice, not that much. So the number of times something occurs should tell you how important this is. Number of times this occurs tells you how important this is. These are sort of the kind of formulas that it's good to have in your formula sheet in case it comes up, but I wouldn't really hang on this being featuring heavily on the exam. And oh, maybe this was the more important one. Um, Focal length, focal length of curved mirror. So this one I'm pretty sure I have memorized. Um, the focal length is equal to a radius of curvature divided by two, right? Yeah, so let's see, am I forgetting any formulas? I think that might be it. So, <clears throat> These are some of the basic things to know in geometric optics. Um, then you go into the application of, like, what do you do with this? So let me call it, I don't know, application. Um, applications. And once you start uh, going into analyzing lenses, um, the way I would divide them uh, is kind of applications that involve single lens and applications that involve multiple lens, right? So with a single lens, here were some things that you were asked to calculate or know how to handle. With a single lens, what, what would be the biggest thing? So this lets you find the, you know, given two of these numbers, lets you find the third number. So given object and focal length, you can find the distance. Um, What's the one thing that you can calculate from that that uh, a question might ask that you might be interested in if you are actually working with the lens? Magnification. Yeah, magnification. So there's the formula for magnification. You have two different magnifications. Magn linear magnification, that's minus the i over d o. It's derived in the book. And there's also um, Angular magnification, which becomes a little bit more tricky. So with the angular magnification, capital M, it um, kind of depends on the setup. If it's a simple magnifier, then the angular magnification was um, focal length, no, uh, near point, divided by focal length for relaxed eye. And you, know, you can look up what it was for the strained eye. 
with the strand i, it's actually plus one for strand i. Um, good. So that's the single lens application. Um, wait, why did I say it's complicated? Oh, um, yeah. So sim simple magnifier, so it's a single lens. If you want more than one lens, that's where you have to know how to handle multiple lens setup. Um, so multiple lenses. Um, and let me just, uh, um, I guess I kind of didn't manage my space while I'm running out of space. Let me just uh, tell you the things you should remember about the multiple lenses. So there's uh, two examples of multiple lens setup that's worked out in your book. I don't ask a lot of questions about those either in your homework or anywhere, but I think reviewing those setup will help reinforce what you're supposed to know. So those two examples that are in the textbook are telescopes and um, microscopes and um, really with the multiple lens what you need to know is how to use, or let me put it this way, um, well, two lenses set up uh, where you need to know how to um, use um, image from um, previous stage as object for next stage. It's a conceptually simple, but as you might remember from some of the examples that we looked at, it's, um, um, it, it's easy, to, uh, easy to make a mistake. So I remember an example in a lecture where we had a virtual image from the first lens, and many people thought that would become virtual object, but it was actually real object. And to cap up, uh, wrap up this with, the thing that you should really be clear on with the geometric optics is this. You should be really clear on sign conventions. Because this is really convention. So with the focal length, the sign convention is simple. If it's converging positive, if it's diverging negative. But what the sign convention really highlights is your understanding of um, real and virtual images and real and virtual objects. So um, especially with the multiple lens, understanding what virtual object is becomes more important. So what sign convention is important for is real slash virtual, distinguishing between those two for both image and object. Yeah. Good. So that's a geometric optics. Um, I think if you can do all the problems and questions, then you're probably fine. I wouldn't worry too much. OK, I only have three minutes. Uh, I didn't budget my time well. So with the physical optics, let me try to list the things that you should review. Um, you should. You should do review waves. It really starts from there. I wish it you know, didn't have to, as in all of you feel comfortable with what you covered about waves in physics 4A that you don't need to review it, but that's really not the case. So you should start out with review of waves. And there are a few you know, things to know about waves, like um, I guess uh, you should know what all these symbols stand for. Wave frequency, wave length, Wave speed, you know, um, knowledge that frequency is usually, wait, wait, knowledge that usually wave speed is property of the wave. And as the wave undergoes, uh, goes from one medium to another, frequency usually remains the same, all that stuff. Good. Um, oh, and this one relationship that relates these together that wave speed is equal to uh, frequency times wavelength. Um, this one is one of those formulas that can, actually that you can remember by dimensional analysis. Meters per second, meter, oh, sorry, meter one over second. 
Right? So, um, so you have that, uh, let's see, what else do you need to review about waves? Uh, things like a superposition principle, And um, this relates back to the electromagnetic nature of light, that intensity is proportional to the electric field squared. Because that uh, features in a lot of the derivations you see. Yeah. And as you are reviewing about the waves, and um, real, this really matters for wave interference, the idea that you need to become familiar with is the idea of phase and the role the phase plays in interference. You have seen that, um, so role that phase plays in two categories of interference in particular, constructive interference, constructive interference, and destructive interference. And for those of you who feel comfortable with this, you know, to get constructive interference, you need to integral cycles of phase or you know, integer multiple of 2 pi. For destructive interference, you need a half integer so, or odd multiples of pi. Um, then the next challenge is to sort of how to take that and actually uh, have an expression for intensity of something. Um, and those, um, Specific examples are worked out um, as so. So these are the basic underlying ideas. They are used to do some calculations that you saw in lecture and in the textbook. Um, the kind of examples that you need to remember are the double slit interference. Double slit interference, and I guess. Um, Actually, the temptation for a lot of people would uh, be to just jump right to this, because that's where you will have your first formulas, like uh, d sine theta is equal to n lambda for constructive, d sine theta is equal to n plus 1 half lambda for destructive. Like, that's where you find the formulas. But I'm really telling you that before you get into the formulas, you need to be uh, on a solid ground with understanding of the interference. Because if you start from here, as you go into um, the other example you will see is a single slit interference. Single slit, uh, sorry, single slit diffraction, which is a result of interference. Um, um, you are going to get confused. Because with a single slit diffraction, the destructive interference actually kind of looks like this. And um, it would not be that confusing if you remember the basics. Because the basic thing that we apply with the phase doesn't change no matter what the application is. So these are the two biggest applications. The other applications that you should know and I need to assign the homework problems on are the thin film interference. Thin film um, interference. And I thought there was at least one more. What am I forgetting? Oh, um, and um, n slit interference, which really leads to uh, diffraction grading. I think that might be it. Did I forget anything? Anything big? Yeah, so double slit interference, that's chapter three. Um, so this is, um, um, as you are reviewing, so this is the place where you should make sure that all these things you are supposed to review and know, that it's so on solid ground here. Because the kind of calculations and geometry considerations you go through here in chapter three is the uh, knowledge and familiarity you will use for analysis of single slit diffraction. Um, I think this is still chapter three, but um, see, I feel like I've forgotten something. Well, let's see. I'm out of time, but let's see if I've forgotten anything. So that was the promise, and now I have all this laid out. Let's see if I've skipped any of the sections.
we did ref uh, refraction. Okay, so th there are these things that I did skip. Uh, total internal reflection, polarization. So, you know, these are um, smaller topics, <laughs> um, which is why they didn't fit here. So total internal reflection that surprisingly actually goes with the refraction, if you remember the critical angle, right? Yes. Um, polarization, so that's the topic of today's lab, and it'll be a small portion of the exam. I guess uh, if I need to fit it somewhere, polarization would really fit in with it here, um, polarization, because the moment you start talking about polarization is when you have to explicitly refer to the electric field. You have to know that uh, not only is light wave, it is a wave of electric field. That's where polarization makes sense. So uh, we are covering this in today's lab, so it's a kind of, that itself is an indication that it's kind of a small thing. Um, let's see, who you guys, uh, yeah. Um, so, okay, week two, uh, we did the images, um, so I guess maybe I probably should have written down explicitly images and uh, whatever, but I think it's kind of all implied here. So, um, so image formed by refraction, lens equation. Oh, I forgot the eye. Um, so, well, I would qualify as a single, it can actually fit in both places. It could be, depending on the setup, it could be a single lens application, lens of the eye, or it could be part of a multiple lens system. Like if you have a corrective lens in front of it or something. Um, so, yeah, magnifier, microscopes and telescopes. Week three, that, uh, yeah, start with the double cell interference. And so this is where things can get more mathematical. This is where we are doing all this complex exponential stuff. And um, I just say it's good for you to know. Uh, someone like an A student would have, you know, worked it through worked through um, this problem set uh, would have done well in the end. But as you're preparing, so that's a sort of later in the list. It's, uh, um, I would actually make sure that I remember, um, be fam I'm familiar with the single slit diffraction. Um, and what your textbook is calling double slit diffraction, this is what you saw in the lab last week as um, sort of superimposed the pattern of both the single slit diffraction and double slit interference. Um, so that's all encompassed here, double slit interference and single slit diffraction. Um, and the, what we covered, uh, what we finished the covering last Tuesday, Tuesday? Last Tuesday are all these, interference in thin film, uh, multiple slit interference, um, which leads to diffraction grading. And oh, I can't believe I forgot this. Um, so I mean, all of this is leading to something important. <laughs> and um, sorry, I got distracted by running out of time. Um, the, um, this is important for an experimentalist. And it's a conceptually important as a repeat, recurring theme in this class. It's uh, diffraction limited resolution. And it's uh, what it's in your textbook as circular aperture and resolution. Or if you are looking for a single thing for you to remember, then it would be the Rayleigh criterion. I can almost guarantee that if there aren't those questions in the past semester's exam, that's one of the things I mean to fix. Um, and the theme, since you will start, I'm hoping you will start to notice it as we go throughout the semester. The theme of this semester is actually this, limited. So, so far in physics, you haven't been really been told about things that are not possible, right? Uh, maybe the one thing we told you is uh, energy conservation. So it is impossible to create energy or destroy energy. And that was kind of it. And the, the, so the biggest theme in modern physics is development of theories that actually tells you uh, things that you might have naively thought as a child should be possible. Like you can have infinitely, arbitrarily precise microscope. This diffraction limited resolution tells you that is not actually possible. There's, um, um, so, 
um, and this uh, limited, it will be a feature of that. You will see that in special relativity, universal speed limit, and um, you will see that in quantum mechanics. The, so, uh, 